This isn't a scene from a movie. A double-decker bus once jumped the gap while London's Tower Bridge was up. Let's go back to the day it happened, the 30th of December, 1952. It was a normal day for the number 78 bus driver, Albert Gunter. He was driving the bus over Tower Bridge toward Shoreditch. Then he noticed that the bridge was opening and his bus was escalating with the bascule. What do I mean by bascule? The two levered sections of the bridge are named this way. They rise up to an angle of 83 degrees, and each of them weighs over 1,100 tons. The bus was going at just 12 miles per hour when the bascule started to rise. The timing was right, and the other side of the bascule wasn't raised too much. That's how Gunter managed to jump the bus from three to four feet high above. 13 people were injured, but all passengers stayed alive. How come the bridge was lifted? Back then, a watchman rang a warning bell and closed the gates before the bridge had to be opened. Yet, on that particular day, they somehow forgot to do so. That's why the bus moved further onto the bridge, thinking it was okay. Why were they lifting the sections in the first place? Because there was a ship that needed to pass under. The bus driver, Albert Gunter, said that the traffic light was also green as he drove across the bridge. He said he'd had two options, either to stop the bus and hope someone would notice the bus, or to jump the gap. If he stopped the bus, he could slip back, perhaps fall into the river. Big congrats to this hero without a cape for making the right decision in a split second. Not just a double-decker, but a plane also has a memory of passing through the Tower Bridge. In 1912, a plane had to fly between the bascules and the walkway. The vertical distance between the upper walkways and the deck of the drawbridge is 141 feet. The pilot, Francis McLean, was in a modified float plane that could fit in between. This is how he managed to fly successfully. He was the first person to fly under the walkways. For many of us, it's super risky and frightening. But for him, it was like a piece of cake. He told the press, It isn't so risky as it appears, for the arches of the bridges are tremendous things when you get close to them. This fellow was a civil engineer, astronomer, pioneering photographer, and aviator. Yeah, sounds like he was the perfect combo for this kind of action. Why did he decide to do this? Thing was, he had an appointment in town. It all happened on a Saturday morning. McLean thought, why wouldn't he go there with his float plane? He took off at 6 a.m. He was at Westminster Pier on a Port of London launch at around 8.30 a.m. Want to hear a story from a prankster who lived in early 1800s London? Theodore Hook and his friend were hanging out as usual. Then they made a bet. Hook bet that he could turn any ordinary house into the most talked about address within a week. The power of a hoax is proven by him. They picked a random house in the city. An ordinary woman named Mrs. Tottingham was living there. Hook wrote numerous letters to many people, from lawyers to cake makers. After a week, guests such as the governor of the Bank of England and the Lord Mayor of London showed up at the door because they had invitations. Not just people, but also the delivery Hook secretly ordered came along too. The heart of London soon turned to a standstill. Picture this. You woke at 5 a.m. after hearing the doorbell. You see a stranger at the doorstep. He says that he's here to sweep the chimneys. You didn't call anyone for this kind of service, so you sent the man back. A few moments later, someone else knocks on the door. Another sweeper tells you that he has been summoned. Poor Mrs. Tottingham. Her maid had to send 20 more men back. Unfortunately, the prank didn't end there. Things like large coal deliveries and wedding cakes were also addressed to her house. As these deliveries and workers accumulated at the door, other people, such as doctors and priests, approached the house, saying that they were called to minister to someone in the house. Hook and his friend rented a small room nearby to watch where their bet ended up. People did show up and made Hook win the bet. Rick Buckley 
is another person who likes practical jokes, but he is also an artist. In 1997, he modeled his nose and stuck it on various places in London with glue. Pardon? Yes, his aim was to protest against CCTV. Such a creative mixture of prank and art. Initially, he glued the noses around 35 landmarks across London. Amongst all, the seven noses of Soho are famous. I guess he doesn't like people poking their noses into other people's businesses. It's time for free association. From the noses placed in random places in the city, it's time to jump into older times, when people used toxic cosmetics on their faces for the sake of beauty. I'll refer to a trendsetter of her time, Queen Elizabeth I. She had a major influence on fashion. Not just women's clothes, but also the style of men got influenced by her choice of wardrobe. Here I'm going to talk more about her iconic white look. This look is achieved by a white foundation called Ceruse. It's made by mixing white lead and vinegar. In that era, people also wanted to bleach freckles and treat blemishes. These types of cosmetics included ingredients like sulfur, turpentine, and mercury. As you can guess, these ingredients are harmful. They end up leaving the skin gray and shriveled. I'm not even going to mention other health issues magic cosmetics caused. Michael Holmes is a pro skydiver and canopy parachutist. No, he isn't a relative of Sherlock Holmes. He's on my list because he survived against all odds. One day, he was instructing new skydivers. It started as a routine day for him. He was on the plane with 16 students. They were going to jump from 15,000 feet. The process was simple on paper. They would allow a free fall for about a minute and then open their canopies at 5,000 feet. That day, things didn't go as planned. Michael released the parachute and it didn't open. He spent seconds trying to get rid of the main parachute so that he could open the reserve one. As he was struggling, he was also continuously spinning. He described the free fall as, I was spinning so fast that I was nearly passing out from the J-Force. He was in a similar situation before, when he had to unsnag the fine cords between the harness and the canopy. He knew that he had a backup and that this system was safe, so he didn't panic. Well, at least at the beginning. This time, he couldn't lose the main canopy. As he was around 4,000 feet, he decided to pull the second parachute, and nothing happened. He was trying to stay calm and find a way to land safely. The lines were still snagged, so the main canopy was still there. He couldn't reach the small knife. He had to cut the lines. What was even worse than spinning was that time was ticking. He was running out of options while moving closer to the ground at a speed of around 80 miles per hour. He had a head camera recording the incident the whole time. After he tried all the options and nothing worked, he waved goodbye to the lens. Luckily, his story didn't end like this. Remember what I said at the beginning? This fellow miraculously survived. He landed on a blackberry bush around two miles above Lake Taupo in New Zealand. He didn't have a severe injury. That means a person can fall from the sky and survive if the conditions are right. What would you do if you were in that situation? That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.